Um, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I was told to not give a policy speech, and I was told to make it personal, and that of course forced me to examine my own qualification, and that's why I called it Life Lessons from an Unreliable Source. Um, I have every reason to call it that. But, um, dear Helmut, dear members of the faculty, board members, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but above all, dear graduates of the Executive Master of Public Administration class of 2017, first things first, um, I offer you my warmest congratulations on your achievement and my very best wishes for the next steps in your career and life that lie ahead of you. You've put yourself, as I've seen, through a demanding course of study, culminating in a thesis. I've read the list of theses, sounded really interesting. And all this in a city and country that for many of you, I gather, is not your home. And in fact, some of you have come from really far away, from Australia, Russia, Norway, even Switzerland. <laughs> and, and I hope that all this gives you a huge and deserved surge of confidence and energy as you continue on your individual past. This is a big deal. And I say this also because when I went to law school, our certificates were mailed to us. Um, we never got pop and circumstance, and I'm really impressed by this. Um, so thank you very much for le letting me live through that vicariously, at least. Um, this happens to be the first time that I've been asked to give a commencement speech, and thinking about this, um, thinking about this long and hard and with some pain, um, led me to the shocking realization that my own commencement at Harvard will have been 30 years ago next year. Then I was 26. Um, that means I must be 55 today. <laughs> and so I asked myself, what have I done? Uh, what have I learned in this time that I can possibly offer to you as an experience that could possibly be relevant and useful to you as you contemplate the life and the career that lies ahead of you in a world that is both more, much more connected and much more disruptive than mine was? And so I have decided to um, divide my talk into six lessons, um, one longish, the other ones are gonna be shorter, and the final ones will be quite short. And my first lesson, uh, which strikes me as really important, given uh, the age that I've just revealed to you, is that aging sucks less than you may think. <laughs> it's both a cliche and true to say that we are probably physically fitter than our parents and certainly our grandparents. The more interesting aspect, though, is what happens to our minds. Um, in all honesty, 30 years ago, the notion of experience was completely meaningless to me. I treated it with contempt. Today, of course, experience gives me co background, context, filters. It helps distinguish what's important from what isn't, and simply put, one freaks out less. I used to freak, quite, freak out quite a lot in my 20s, and it's frankly a relief that this happens less than it used to. So, as I said, aging is better than you've been told. <laughs> And for those of us who expect to adapt, learn new things, and shift gears throughout our lives, it isn't, it isn't even all that important, honestly. You should understand, though, that the process of aging isn't linear. Profoundly shocking life experiences, what the poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in his theory of the novella called Die Unerhörte Begebenheit, can throw you into a dark cave for years, and they can also light a clear flame in you. And in one of my favorite novellas of all, the, the Marquise von Ohr by Heinrich von Kleist, the heroine has to undergo a truly extraordinary test of character and fortitude. For any of you who haven't read it, please do read it. She passes this test, and as she leaves the place of her ordeal in a carriage, the story was published in 1808, Kleist says of her, durch diese schöne Anstrengung mit sich selbst bekannt gemacht, by this splendid effort revealed to herself, which I think is a lovely passage, and tells you something about what that kind of experience may do to you. Nor, I have to tell you, does aging produce consistency, and I personally believe consistency is overrated. The older people I admire most are those who combine a mature judgment, youthful enthusiasm and curiosity, and a rather childish sense of humor. Minions, anyone? I like the minions. And as for my fellow graduates back in 1988, we will probably remain 26 to each other until we die. And I have no doubt that some of my best loved friends, the ones who asked me to be godmother to their children, would be laughing like hyenas at the idea of my giving a commencement speech. You will find, as I did and still do, that the affectionate sarcasm and the laser sharp criticism of your generational cohort keeps you grounded. Finally, know that when the first wrinkles appear around your 
eyelids, a fine coat of Vaseline on the bathroom mirror really works wonders. That brings me to a somewhat more serious second lesson, which is that your future, as mine did, holds unimaginable disruptions. Your circumstances, of course, and I know you were older as executive um, masters than, than we were when we graduated, but your circumstances are as different from mine 30 years ago as mine were from those of my parents in the early 1950s. My West German parents belonged to a generation that had lived through the horror of World War II and the Holocaust as young adults or children. Survival, literally, was a miracle for them. What came after was a piece of cake in comparison. And the shadow of war and genocide, of course, loomed long over their lives. And the prospect of nuclear annihilation throughout the Cold War wasn't exactly cheerful. But they lived through the post-war economic upspring, the creation of NATO and the EU, and saw the fall of the Berlin Wall in their later lives and the reunification of Europe. They had seen rather too much of history, of course, to buy Francis Fukuyama's theory that it was all going to be over in 1989. But for them, the post-war era up to the very end of their lives was one of ever-increasing optimism. As for us 20-somethings in the mid-1980s, compared to your much globally traveled and connected generation, we were hopelessly provincial. To begin with, there were no public policy schools in Germany at the time. Um, and I frankly think it's wonderful that schools like the Hertie School and some others exist. This was something that was direly needed, and it's a remarkable achievement that we now have this. My law school teachers at the time explained that the law would prepare us for anything and everything, and if you had to do something more shallow, you could always do economics. <laughs> so frankly, we left for America. The labor market, as I was saying to one of you earlier as we were waiting for pomp and circumstance, the labor market didn't want us anyway in the mid-80s. And in my case, as Helmut kindly said, I was lucky enough to get this fellowship to Harvard. And it's hard to comprehend today, and it's probably very hard for you to comprehend just how big a step that was. Airline travel from a student perspective cost a fortune, you just didn't do it. International phone calls were really expensive, and transatlantic love affairs tended not to last as a consequence. Letters, not so great. Our source of news was NPR and the New York Times, and international newspapers were, were to be had, either in the libraries or at the kiosk in Harvard Square, always at least a week late, incredibly expensive, and very small numbers. And so the result was that our ties to our old lives thinned very quickly. And the result of that was that we realized that we'd begin, been given an enormous gift, which was the gift of freedom, first, from parental observation, from family, social constraints, and observations. This varied from whether you were German or Indian, female or male, but the effect was quite remarkable on most of us. And even more importantly, and the one follows from the other, of course, it was the freedom to reinvent ourselves. And for the Europeans, our transplantation to America meant liberating from the stagnating politics of the Cold War, which seemed at the time, of course, as though it would last forever and ever. We, we could not imagine that this would ever change. And of course, for the Germans, again, all West Germans, of course, there were no East Germans. I was, um, and of course, no Russians, no Chinese, no Indians, no Ukrainians. Our terrible 20th century history always went with us, but it, it no longer seemed quite as oppressively life-determining. Some of you may have seen the recent television series uh, made by Sundance, Deutschland 83. Um, that's pretty much the atmosphere that, um, that we left Germany in. Um, and it was quite dark and quite oppressive. And of course, in this giddy, churning, anything goes atmosphere of Reagan era America, liberation meant the permission to transform. Most aspects of identity were up for discovery, invention or renegotiation. Some of our friends came out as gay, which took huge courage in the early years of the AIDS crisis. And for the women, we were thunderstruck to realize that our American female classmates spoke about their career expectations as though they were men. I cannot, it is hard to conceive today just how shocking this was for us. That, by, for me, certainly, now, 30 years later, is a huge measure of progress. It was truly electrifying and very empowering. And the last thing that was empowering was that our American teachers seemed to want to teach us and want us to succeed. This was also something we weren't used to. <laughs> Judith Sklar, an eminent Harvard scholar of political philosophy, a Jew from Riga who had fled to America via Shanghai and Canada and who was my most beloved 
and revered the teacher, once said to me, Constanze, in German exams, they were trying to show you what you don't know. We here want to know what you do know. And I'm assuming, I'm hoping that was different for you here too, because things in Germany have changed too. Now, a lot of us at the time stayed in America because we didn't want to come back to America. Um, and I was thinking about it myself until one cold morning in November of 1989, I'd stayed on to write a doctoral thesis, when everything changed. A friend of mine called me up and said, turn on the TV. I did. And there were pictures of the war and in grainy black and white and people were dancing on it and waving champagne bottles. And I did something that profoundly surprised me because I had never given the war much thought. To me, this was part of, part of the Cold War dispensation, part of the punishment for World War II and the Nazis and the Holocaust. I burst into tears. And I was back on a plane to Germany on December 5th, full of hope and excitement, and I wanted to be a part of this. And to me, one of the truly greatest things of my life is <laughs> how much has changed in this town. And the fact that we are now standing here in what used to be East Berlin, in front, and I'm standing in front of you, a class literally from all parts of the world, and that we can be here together. I, f I still find that remarkable, and as you can see, it still chokes me up. Yeah. So as Helmut said, I was lucky to, in my further path, I became a journalist. I did an internship here and recently reunified Berlin. I joined Die Zeit and later the think tank and I lived through and increasingly wrote about the end of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, the enlargement of NATO and the EU, genocide in Rwanda and the Balkans and war crimes tribunals, the creation of an international criminal court and Germany's cautious steps towards a more forward-leaning foreign policy. I was in Rwanda, I was in the Balkans, I was in Afghanistan. Um, again, all unimaginable for somebody who finished law school in Bonn in 1985. And it was an extraordinarily heady time to live and to write about. And like my parents, I wasn't so sure about the whole end of history thing, but again, I was like they convinced that things would only get better because they had to, right? Because that's how it had been going. In particular, we, we, I and my generation, we were convinced that universal human rights, liberal democracy, and good governance were on a roll and could never be rolled back. And I realize that now this must all seem very far away for you and maybe quite unduly optimistic and cheerful. A friend of mine went to a seminar hosted by um, a foreign ministry, a European foreign ministry recently, and posted on Facebook, Facebook that the hosts were calling the 90s the utopian decade. I find that incredibly saddening because I, I do refuse to believe that this was just a blip on the screen. And I would say that you actually have some advantages that we didn't have and that are enormous increases in freedom. Data, ideas, goods, and in fact you yourselves are as mobile as no generation before you. You've already seen more of the world and worked in more places than we could have thought possible at your age. And if I'm not mistaken, you take entirely for granted that you and you alone decide who you are and that you can change your mind whenever you please. That identity is fluid, multiple, fungible, changeable over time. So to me, compared to us 30 years ago, you seem enviably free. Yet you must be as aware as I am, or even more so, that at the same time, the political landscapes around us, domestic, European, transatlantic, and global, have darkened. The international order that my parents' generation created, which we inherited, appears to be under siege from all sides. American leadership of the free world is in question as never before, and it is being challenged aggressively by other powers. The transatlantic relationship, traditional bulwark of the West, is at issue on both sides of the Atlantic. And so is free trade and globalization, all things that I grew up believing were good and would be forever and worth cherishing and preserving. Europe itself is riven by political divides, north and south and east and west and more. And some European leaders, of course, openly doubt the validity and viability of the European project itself. Ivan Krastev, the Bulgarian intellectual, a friend of mine who spoke to the incoming class of heritage students yesterday, has just, um, is arguing in his new book, After Europe, that the migration crisis may in fact herald the disintegration of the European Union. 
And of course, we know that at home, populists and ethno-nationalists, not just in America, are repudiating democracy itself, and with it, the most fundamental principles of Western constitutionalism, such as the separation of powers and the protection of minorities against the tyranny of, of the majority. For me, as a German of my generation, a German who was taught by emigre Jews in America, that is truly shocking. That is just about the worst thing I can think of. But even if the worst predictions that are currently somewhat en vogue fail to pass, so if winter doesn't come after all, one thing does seem absolutely certain to me, which is that my generation's blithe assumption that the Western model would somehow self-replicate automatically all over the world because everybody would want to be like us has turned out to be incorrect. The future of the Western-led order is literally open, and so is yours. In more ways, and more, more troubling ways, than was ever the case for us. So how can you prepare, and what can I possibly tell you about this, for a life of disruption? And I think my third lesson then, this is where things get shorter, don't worry, don't just be consumers of fate. When I was your age, there was a widespread belief among my peers that we would be inheriting a world that others had designed. State institutions, the economy, society, all these were parts of a carefully calibrated system that we would somehow have to learn how to operate and perhaps perform the odd repair job on. But we thought it would essentially maintain itself, and we would never ever be asked to redesign it. Now, of course, the fall of the war, 1989, blew a fairly large hole into this assumption. But your generation will have to adapt and indeed invent on a broader scale than any other generation before you. And I'm not suggesting, of course, that you throw everything overboard. Human rights, the vote, independent courts, alliances of Western democracies, none of this should be up for disposal. And it's, in fact, worth fighting for. And I hope you may never have to. But the digitalization of every aspect of our lives has consequences for the functioning of the state, for the future of work for democratic participation in ways that we've only just begun to understand. And the work of adaptation still lies before us. And of course, globalization and integration will remain with us, contra contrary to what the Nigel Farages and the Stephen Bannons of this world believe. They're facts of life. They're not a wrong ideology, a false, con uh, a false consciousness, as they used to say in the 60s, or God forbid, fake news. But we do need to do much better at distributing their benefits and burdens equitably and at, and at protecting the weak and the disadvantaged from their impact. Arguably, today's populist surges are punishments for our failure to do so until now, and this is a task that lies before you. So in sum, you will have to be citizens rather than just consumers, architects rather than just repairmen. And that brings me to my fourth lesson, which is to embrace your own personal disruptions. Now, you, because you've already worked, because you've written CVs and rewritten them, you will know that as we work through our lives, we tend to rewrite our stories as a compelling linear narrative of seamless upward progress, just like history, right? Most professional CVs bear very eloquent testimony to this creative editing process. And in fact, most of us actually believe ourselves when we do this. And let me tell you, and if I didn't tell you my friend's word, that my life path since graduation has been more often than not shaped by ignorance, naivete, luck and chutzpah. Sometimes I only found that out afterwards, and there are phases that I remember with sadness and regret. I owe a great deal to the kindness and the forbearance of others, and if it happens to you, recognize it, be grateful for it, and remember to pass it on. That said, I believe one thing did save me several times, and that was an inner voice that dared me to explore new things, even in the face of a chorus of disapproval, and my own fear of failure. As you've heard, I've trained in the law, then did a public policy master, then wrote a doctoral thesis, then did a journalistic internship, then joined a weekly paper, and then left it for an American think tank. Every single time, people whose judgment I really cared about said I was insane. And I did it anyway, but at the same time, I was terrified they might be right, and of course, I had no way of knowing that they were not. Some of my new beginnings were really, really hard, and there were long stretches where I was pretty sure that the people who said I was insane were actually sadly right. But it's worked out. Some of you may have seen the 2014 Richard Linklater movie Boyhood. Um, it follows its central character from childhood into adult life and was filmed over the course of 12 years in real time. 
And in one really memorable scene near the end, the boy's mother, played by Patricia Arquette, downsizes her household after both her children have moved out. And as she packs her boxes, she says, in a mixture of tears and bewilderment, I thought there would be more. And that scene has stayed with me, but it's actually not a feeling that I share. And nor should you. Live in such a way that you won't. Listen to that inner voice, summon that inner strength, face your fear, and dare to follow your interest, and if it all goes wrong, at least you will have owned your mistake. That brings me to my last two very short lessons. Lesson five, beware people who don't have a sense of humor, people who know what's funny usually can be trusted to know what isn't. And I mean that very seriously. Lesson six, and there's a reason why I say this, be kind. Political correctness is tedious, yes, but it will not have escaped you that in these disruptive times, a new cruelty is returning to public discourse. Fight it wherever you can. And that's my last word to you. Thank you very much for your attention.